Hello and welcome to the Sailing and Cruising the East Coast of the United States podcast. I'm Bela Musitz. And I'm Mike Wasserman. This is our podcast about sailing the East Coast of the United States. In some episodes, we'll focus on passages and destinations. And in other, other episodes, we will talk about boats, equipment, and techniques. And when we come across an interesting person, we'll try to get them as a guest on the show. But before we dive into this episode, we need to say a special thank you to our supporters. Several listeners are supporting the podcast via Patreon. If you would like to join them, you can go to patreon.com forward slash sailing the east. Hey, Bela, great to see you. And yeah, thanks to the listeners for their continued listening and their support. Um, you know, longtime listeners will realize that we kind of have a routine here, Bela. And this week we're changing things up and we switched roles. So let me ask you for once, are you curious to know who our guest is today? <laughs> yes, yes, Mike, I am curious. Uh, for those of you who are not longtime listeners, usually I do the interviews. Uh, but in this one, Mike is doing the interview. So, Mike, who's our guest today? Thanks for asking, Bela. Our guest today is Chris Kabiziak from Tampa, Florida. And Chris is an organizational psychologist by training, but is a passionate sailor who actually got a start in racing when he was a, a, a younger man, a kid, really. Um, he's done a lot of cruising through the Gulf of Mexico and down in the Caribbean. And then the interesting layers, he's also a broker uh, that buys and sells sail, sailboats. So Chris was a really easy guest to interview. What do you think? Are you ready? Yeah, let's dive right into this uh, interview, Mike. All right, we're here with Chris Kabiziak. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Mike. Really happy to be here. So first of all, tell us where you're joining us from. So I am currently at home in sunny Tampa, Florida, where we are enjoying Chamber of Commerce weather. This is that little gap between the heat of the summer and the cold when you really can't sail effectively. So it's absolutely prime sailing conditions right now. Beautiful. You're about, so you must be about 75 degrees warmer than I am right now because it's cold and gray here. So I'm glad there's sunshine for one of us. Great. So maybe Chris, um, tell us a little bit. I mean, you and I have known each other for a long time and I know that yep. sailing has always been a big part of your life. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about your kind of your sailing history? Sure. Happy to do it. So I grew up in Chicago, the suburbs of Chicago, for those uh, listeners who are in our similar demographic, think John Hughes movies, uh, Shermer High School, Shermer, Illinois, that was, that was where I grew up, and moved to Florida my freshman year of high school, the absolute worst time to relocate a kid of that age, and was completely miserable with the transition to Florida. Everything you heard about Florida is true, uh, it's just worse than what you think. So that was a tough transition. But my dad's boss um, offered to take us sailing one day, my mom, my dad, and I. He had a J30, which he had to deliver from St. Petersburg to his home yacht club, which is here in Tampa, Davis Island Yacht Club, which I'm now a member of, spoiler alert. Um, and so he invited us out. We did a beautiful sail. It was, again, it was the weather like it is now. It was beautiful weather, perfect sailing conditions everything aligned just so. And I realized, you know what, this this is not so bad. I, I actually really like this. And he was very gracious about inviting me to come sailing with them on Thursday nights. So here in Tampa, uh, you know, a lot of yacht clubs around the country, around the world for that matter, do um, evening races. They call it beer can racing. So it's very casual, informal racing around, you know, a course near the club and what have you. Um, here in Tampa, we do Thursday nights, and he invited me out on Thursday nights. So I became a regular on that boat very quickly, which is unusual for a kid of that age. And that's where I learned. Um, this is back in 1984, so a long time, and have been sailing ever since. And since then, um, I've done a fair amount of racing on the west coast of Florida. Uh, I know this flies in the face of the title of the podcast. Apologies. Still Eastern time zone, though, so I think that should count in some Actually. It counts. Absolutely. But thank okay. you for your sensitivity and your situational awareness, Chris. I try to be. I try I try to be a good guest, you know, and I don't want to step on any sensibilities given the uh, the subject matter. Um, I will As you point know, we out, have very little sensibility, so don't don't worry. Well, I will point out that we get the sunsets on the west coast of Florida. You guys have beautiful sunrises beautiful. on the east coast, but we get to have a drink in our hand and watch the sunset. It's a little bit different program. True. Um, so then I've been racing mostly on the west coast of Florida, uh, a little bit of distance racing, which we can talk about. Uh, I've done races to Mexico, to Havana, uh, to Key West, all out of the, the Tampa Bay area. 
Um, and then a fair amount of chartering as well. We've had some good opportunities to do that. I think there might be some interesting things to talk about there, especially if anybody has interest in chartering or, you know, kind of pro tips for how to get into that and things to be aware of, uh, like the first time you go, we can, we can discuss some of those things as well. Um, and so that's kind of been my history of sailing. I, I realized a couple of Thanksgivings ago, we were doing the whole thing where you go around the table and give thanks. And it dawned on me that everybody there was someone either that I met through the Yacht Club or met through sailing. And it occurred to me in that moment to be very thankful for the, the club itself and the opportunities that I've had uh, to meet people through through the sailing community around here. It's it's a pretty big group. It's a pretty close-knit group and a lot of really friendly people. And, and I've really enjoyed that whole experience. So I, I've kind of veered from, you know, the history and my origin in sailing to the social aspect of it. But it is it is by nature a very social sport. That's forgive me. I can't. You can take the psychology out of this a little bit, but you know, you you know how we are, Mike. We're psychologists. We always return to that. Absolutely, and and you know, this has been a common theme. We've done over a hundred episodes now, and the the sense of community. And again, you know, I'm the sailing outsider, but from the outside looking in, the sense of community, um, the camaraderie, the inclusion um, that y- you get when you sail. Um, to me, is a big part of the benefits of why people invest so much money and time into into this activity. Um, because much more so than other activities that I can think of, there really is this kind of people are supportive, people are kind, people are nice, people help each other. You know, it's neat. Well, it comes from a shared knowledge and a shared experience base of sailing. And also, this is going to sound overly dramatic, and I don't mean it to, but there's an element of survival, right? I mean, there are times when things get pretty hairy on a boat or even in a marina. You know, we have hurricanes in Florida. This is no small thing. And we look out for each other. We look out for each other's boats. When you're in a marina, you know, if you're walking by and somebody's boat is rubbing against the piling because a line came loose or wasn't tied correctly, it's just common courtesy to fix it and address it. And it's just, it's baked into the sport itself. Which is neat. And it's something that in some parts of society, we seem to have lost that common caring and common courtesy. So I like to hear stories about this. It, it always makes me happy and it gives me hope um, for the future in a lot of ways. But neat. Yeah, Let- you, you said a lot there, actually. And, and kind of just to put a button on, on sort of my journey in this, my, my recent thing has been getting into yacht brokerage. And you meet a tremendous amount of people as, as a yacht broker of all kinds of political persuasions and what have you. And, you know, one of the common complaints in our culture is nobody's willing to listen to anybody outside their bubble. Um, the sailing community really does a good job of getting through that. There are a lot of people that I know through sailing that have wildly different political perspectives than I do. But we can still have those intelligent conversations, reach across the aisle, listen to each other intelligently and thoughtfully, and have a meaningful conversation because of that shared basis. And I think as long as you can get to that point, you know, you can have some thoughtful conversations, but, you know, sailing provides a bridge to that, I think. I may be overselling it, but... uh, it's an interesting idea. I mean, this might be a whole future podcast episode. I don't know if we want to go there or not, but it is interesting is when you have common ground, um, how can you use that to bridge some of the gaps that faces society? Not only in the US, but we have it here in Europe as, as well, of course. Of course. Um, so it's kind of a human thing right now. Neat. Well, you mentioned three idea. kind of main topics and I want to try to get to all three and maybe we break this into two episodes but you know maybe first talk a little bit about racing and you know your history there and what you um what you get out of the racing um experience and how it's kind of shaped you and kind of what some of maybe a, a, a favorite anecdote or two and then I, lo- I love the idea of talking about chartering a little bit because i think mm-hmm. there's a, a group of our listeners that i w- would be very interested in that um and then that that third piece it's very interesting to me about the brokerage side about kind of advice that you have for buying and selling and kind of what you've seen from your perspective so maybe let's start with the the racing and maybe tell a couple of your favorite anecdotes about about racing and what you've you've taken away from that so racing my introduction to sailing was through racing and um I, i full disclosure i don't own a boat don't necessarily want to own a boat I'm a big believer in other people's boats and there are always people looking for crew. So if you want to get into sailing or racing bigger boats, um, if you show up at any yacht club, anywhere where they're having races at any kind of amateur level, like there's a, there's a whole professional level. That's a whole different story. Um, we can save that for another time, but I think we're talking about racing that's more accessible to, to folks like us and, and folks that might be in the audience. Um, 
there are always openings at clubs. We're always looking for crew. Uh, we're always looking to introduce people to the sport. Um, it is, you know, it has sort of a reputation of being a little bit elitist or exclusive. Um, and it really isn't. Like once you get to know people who are into racing and into sailing, it's folks from all walks of life. I mean, yes, it takes, you know, a certain level of means to to run a racing program. I mean, the boats are not cheap and maintaining them and, and especially maintaining them to, to sail at optimal performance is, is not an inconsequential thing. Um, but you know for crew you get everybody you get everybody from young kids all demographics all walks of life coming together in in if you will a common cause it sounds trite to say but that's really what it is um this harkens back to what we were talking about earlier you get people together that wouldn't necessarily hang out on a given saturday afternoon or spend a weekend or a three-day weekend together uh, but because of the racing program you know they come together they learn together as a group and it's a function of learning sailing you know, learning how, how to sail a boat, how to get the boat around the water, um, how to do it very effectively, because you have to optimize everything to, in order to race effectively. Um, and then, you know, to get the people to come together. And again, that's one of the biggest things for me. I've had the very good fortune of having been with some crews that work incredibly well together. And that's really where the fun is. We, we've had a program um, on a boat called Wired out of Davis Island. It was a FAR 395, still is a FAR 395. Uh, we don't race on that boat anymore. The owner sold it. But for about 10 years, we campaigned that boat on the west coast of Florida and won the uh, Suncoast Boat of the Year a couple of times. And, you know, our crew was just, it was kind of a lightning in the bottle thing. It was, you know, one guy was a contractor, one guy was an engineer, I'm a psychologist, another guy did construction, you know, all different folks. And, you know, we all came together and sailed and it took us a couple of years to get the boat dialed in, but we sailed very, very well together. And, you know, you get to know people on a level uh, of intimacy, if you will, that you would not otherwise experience. Um, because like, there's an old cliche in racing that like a really well run sailboat is very quiet because everyone knows what's supposed to happen and everyone knows what you're supposed to do. Somebody will say when we're tacking, when we're driving, the tactician and the helmsman will be talking to each other. But the rest of the crew is actually pretty quiet. They're calling puffs. They're looking at wind. They're looking at other boats. You know, they're providing information. But it's all at a very subdued conversational level. Um, when you know you see videos and things of mark roundings and people screaming and yelling at each other, that's not because things are going well. You know, that's because something went awry and people are course correcting or trying to provide information and shouting over each other. Uh, you know, it can work and you can bail yourself out of a situation in a crisis, um, but that's not what's supposed to happen. So as far as my racing experience, again, mostly uh, Thursday nights just because of volume. Like that's that's what we do during daylight savings time. Every Thursday night is how we wind down from the week. We have probably about anywhere, depending on the conditions, anywhere from 20 to 50 boats on a given night racing in different classes, um, mostly uh, PHRF racing. Um, and then on the weekends, when when it's standard time in Florida, it's a bit cooler and you have more wind during the day. So that's when we do our boat of the year events, which will be regattas that are typically one to three days over the course of a weekend. And there's a whole series of those. Um, and that involves a lot of logistics. You got to get the boat from its home club to wherever the race is that weekend. Someone has to take care of that. You got to get crew there. You got to get crew back if it's multiple days. You know, some folks will sleep on the boat. Um, some will actually try to get some rest and go home and then come back the next day. There's a lot of pieces to it. So Interesting. Um, and yeah. what have been some of your memorable races that you've been involved in? So probably the most memorable are the distance races. Like when um, the Obama administration had opened up uh, Cuba, we did a race from St. Petersburg to Havana. Uh, cool. That was interesting. Um, just the experience, number one, of sailing there. It took about three days to get there, three and a half days. Um, and then being in Havana was, of course, interesting in its own, right? That could be its own podcast. That's that's a whole other conversation. Um, but you meet a tremendous amount of people that are, are, again, taking this very seriously. Like there's safety briefings. The boats have to be approved. You have to take safety courses. You have to be aware of what's going on. And then you kind of test yourself. You know, it's it's a very different animal being offshore. And there's really no way to describe it uh, without 
just getting out there and doing it. Like you can talk about the fatigue, you're cold, you're wet, you know, you're racing, you're sort of in battle, you know, it's, it's, you're there with your crew and everybody bonds and everybody, you know, like there's fights on board, of course, there's conflict like there is anywhere, but you get over it and you're much closer at the end of that race as a result. Um, but those things are exhausting. But you have interesting anecdotes that happen. So we sailed, uh, again, St. Petersburg to Havana, sailed well, had pretty consistent wind conditions, um, had an interesting issue where our head stay, we were, we were uh, for the audience who knows more about sailing, I'll, I'll tell the story very quickly, but we were going through the uh, Florida Straits about four o'clock in the morning, we had a reacher up and strangely our head stay came loose uh at, at the bow like something happened and there was a pin that had sheared and it was loose so being my role on the boat is typically on the bow so another guy and i ran up on the bow and again this is dark you're tired you know all hands on deck oh my god um we had to get up there you know fix the head stay and then you know if we hadn't had the reacher up the rig probably would have come down like if we were beating or, or had the the jib up it would have been a, a genuine crisis but as it was we were able to affect the repair and then sail on we didn't lose that much time ended up probably in about second place corrected as we were coming into havana and we were racing against another boat uh that's kind of a sister boat it's not the same type of boat this was on uh, an aerodyne 35 that i was on and we were racing against a, a far 395 and the wind died as happens with racing you know and and again it's hot humid you're tired you're sitting there fatigued i just want to get in i want to get a shower i want to get some you know warm food and i'm looking over the side of the boat into the water and i understand now where mermaids come from because i'm pretty sure i was hallucinating and i was seeing things in the water and you know psychologist that i am i'm thinking wow i could see where if somebody is really fatigued and dehydrated how they could see these things that i'm seeing and think that they were mermaids and then i thought dude what is wrong with you like, get it together man we're almost at the finish <laughs> like, pull yourself together anyway the boat we're racing against went way 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 to the east and you know the currents going through there you know you have the gulf stream and all that kind of stuff but we had it all dialed in our tactician was like no we're sailing on this course and we're sailing a vector we're going to go right into the harbor wind dies and we're like well those guys are really screwed because there's no wind they're never going to come back and we're watching them moving steadily up the coast the northern coast of cuba back toward havana and they ended up beating us by a couple of hours and it was the strangest thing so after the race um not at the awards ceremony but they, they have a whole bunch of cocktail receptions things like that you know havana chamber of commerce things we were talking to one of the guys on the boat a great sailor i've raced with him many times um his name's uh, Vladimir Kulinichenko. Uh, he's Russian Ukrainian guy. Many, many stories. He's a world class sailor. He travels all over the world. And I asked him, I'm like, what, what was that all about? And he said, Oh, well, when I was a kid, you know, living in Russia, um, we actually vacationed in Havana. And I know the currents on the northern side of that island. And there was a rip current there that I almost got caught in when I was a little kid. And I knew that if we could get the boat into that current, that would push us much faster toward the finish line than taking the course that you guys did and and wow. it worked it totally worked for them local knowledge from you know a russian guy who vacationed as a kid in havana and they smoked us into the finish and we ended up getting third corrected overall which we were still pretty proud of i mean out of about 20 boats in our fleet so that was that was fun that was a good time it's a small world isn't it, it is a very right? small in a lot of ways it is a very small world Interesting. Yeah. Let's switch gears and talk about chartering a little bit because you've got a lot of experience there. And what do you think are some interesting points or or helpful points um, that the listeners might might benefit from from your experience? Um, sure. Number one is just for the love of God, go do it. Um, it can be very intimidating, you know. If you if you're thinking, well, bear a boat, captain, what do I do? If you can get a boat around a race course, or if you can get a boat in and out of a slip. Um, you're going to be fine chartering. And what I would recommend is start with the BVI, the British Virgin Islands. Um, there's a lot of chartering there. It's, I don't want to say it's idiot proof because as soon as you say something is idiot proof. Yeah, I'm the idiot. So idiot. Right, we know better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, but the navigation is easy. It's by sight. Most of the islands are right there on Sir Francis Drake Channel. And your navigation is today we're going to Norman Island over there. Today we're going to Yost Van Dyke, which is over there. And like you can see it. And the only real challenge to it is getting to a mooring ball before all the mooring balls are gone. So with chartering, you're only allowed to sail uh, or navigate by day. Like when it's dark, you're supposed to be either at anchor or in a slip or on a mooring ball. Um, and that's really the only limitation you have. You have the freedom to go anywhere you want. 
Uh, so I would recommend a BVI doing that. Um, there are other places you can go once you've kind of gotten the hang of it, but it's an easy start there. The water is deep. People are friendly. There are lots of charter bases. Um, I will offer a plug for the moorings. Um, there are a number of charter operations in the islands. I have heard mixed reviews on the majority of them. I've never heard anybody say anything bad about the moorings. I mean, we had problems with incorrect power cord or the dinghy wouldn't start or whatever have you. And they have somebody there within an hour, two hours, you know, taking care of you. Whereas other charter companies that I'm aware of, nothing but problems. And the boats aren't well maintained. That's a bit of an issue, of course. So um, there are a lot of considerations there. So, you know, my main thing is get out there and try it. Um, nice. It is intimidating. And you've gone, oops, sorry, okay. go ahead. Oh, please. You've gone a little farther afield too than just the Caribbean, right? We have, we have. We've had the good fortune of uh, chartering with a lot of friends in different places. We've been to, let's see, the BVI. Um, we've been to the Abacos, which is essentially a portion of the Bahamas. Very different, very flat, very shallow, which is a key consideration. Like you're never going to run aground. Well, you could run aground in the BVI, but you kind of have to try. Um, in the Bahamas, it's a challenge because it is very shallow. Um, we've also been to, we did a, a charter from in the Leeward Islands, going from St. Lucia uh, down through St. Vincent and the Grenadines into Granada. Wonderful experience. Absolutely beautiful sailing, you know, consistent breeze, consistent winds. We did that on a, a sailing uh, catamaran, which honestly for charter, catamaran's the way to go. It's a tremendous amount of space. If, you know, four couples with a lot of room, everybody has their own stateroom, everybody has their own head, big salon area, great, great like quality of life way to sail. Um, the trip we did in the Abacos, actually, it was race week in the Abacos, and we followed the racing fleet around. We had a, a catamaran, which they're, they're slow. You don't really want to race those so much. But um, it's a, a race for primarily monohulls, and they go from different islands in the Abacos and different marinas and different locations. And what we did was we would kind of sleep in, let them start racing. We would sail to where they were going and then get there just ahead of them for the party every night. So we were hanging out with all the racers and, and a lot of these people we know from other events. Uh, but we were doing sort of the more casual uh, tour of that and, and meeting up with them. Wonderful. It's like my them. speed right there. Like you get all the benefits without any of the costs. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Brilliant. Without without having to be up at the crack of dawn and without having to exactly. kill yourself sailing for the day. Yeah, it was wonderful. It was a wonderful experience. Um, most recently, we were we did Tahiti. We sailed in French Polynesia, which everybody says it's Tahiti. It's not actually Tahiti. You fly into Tahiti. And then you fly to um, Wright's Hea, which is where the charter base is. And then there's a number of islands that you do out there. We sailed to Bora Bora and Taha'a and a number of other islands that are just fun to say. Beautiful, absolutely unspoiled, pristine area. Um, a little more challenging from a sailing standpoint if you're bear boating. Uh, the passages between the islands are a little bit rough. You know, we've had some people succumb to seasickness. It's, you know, like so if you're going from Taha'a to Bora Bora, it's about an eight-hour passage in reasonably, you know, three to four-foot seas, which is no small thing. The interesting thing about the islands there, though, is they're all surrounded by motus. So, like, you'll have an island, like the island of Bora Bora that you picture with the mountain and everything. Around all of that are, are what are called motus, which are essentially reefs that are built up into sandbars. And within the Motu, there's always like a pass that you have to go in. And once you're in there, it's like flat water. Like it's steady breeze, but incredibly flat water, which is perfect for sailing, you know, anchoring. And the water is gorgeous. Like you see these photographs of, you know, like the yacht and you can see the shadow underneath it. And it looks like it's, you know, floating in, in there. It's exactly like that. Like those photos are not an exaggeration. Like it absolutely looks like that. It's incredible. Neat. Cool. And right. Again, with a lot of our guests come on, we're both you and your partner are both sailors and both experienced sailors. Yeah, and that makes nice sailing, like this yeah. work really well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Neat. Um, yeah. Interesting things like quality of life things like in chartering in, in the Caribbean. Um, you know, one thing is provisioning, like know your crew, know what you want on the boat, know how much booze you want you're going to drink more than you probably think. And what's going to happen is you're going to get there, you're going to be in full-on party mode, you're going to drink way too much the first couple of days, think, oh my God, we're almost out of everything, and then you will slow down, and you'll relax, you kind of get into island time, and you don't burn through your provisions quite as much. But interesting thing, um, anecdotally, bread is really hard to get in the Caribbean. It's damn near impossible to get fresh bread, and you just resign yourself to the fact that it's just hard to get bread. There aren't many bakeries, everything's humid, you know, you're bringing stuff in by dinghy. 
Um, sometimes there will be a guy that comes out in a dinghy and sells bread in the morning and it's, it's okay. It's fine. You know, it's, it's during the islands. What's not to like, you can live without bread. Then you go to Tahiti and you know, Tahiti is French Polynesia, which means baguettes, no matter where you go, there are baguettes everywhere and they're delicious and they're fresh baked. Uh, we went, there's an Island out there called Mapiti and the whole Island has about 600 people on it and and super friendly like the nicest people you'll ever meet you start to learn you know uh um polynesian language and everything it's it's amazing and uh all these people like on bikes riding by with fresh baguettes it's it's the craziest thing beautiful it's wonderful nice. yeah we know where you're going right anecdote. We, we rented bikes on on my pt right and, and we kind of walked we had to hike for a little while and we found this guy that rents bikes and he's like yeah you know it's it's whatever 30 you know French Polynesian francs for the day. And we're like, okay, um, do you need, you know, do you want ID or anything? He's like, no, no. He's like, you know, it's, it's fine. It's not that big an island. You're, you're not going to take the bikes with you. They're not going to go anywhere. There's one road. So even if you abandon the bikes, I'll send my son out later in the day. He'll find the bikes. It's fine. <laughs> and we did the ride around. It was beautiful. It's, it's gorgeous, Neat. but it's, such, it's, 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 it's like, um, I don't want to sound ethnocentric about it, but it's kind of like the land that time forgot. Like it's when you think island paradise and nice people and unspoiled and no t-shirt shops, no tchotchkes, all of that stuff, that's what it is. Like it's really, it, it takes forever to get there. And yeah, it's kind of pricey, but it is absolutely worth the time and the money you will spend to charter out there. It's, it's a bucket list item for anybody who has interest. I would strongly recommend it. And it hasn't been discovered yet. Nice. That's a good pro tip, Chris. I like it. Um, one other pro tip, last one for sure. chartering. Go for uh, it. No, to Florida. Um, during COVID, uh, a friend of mine called me up and said, hey, you know, um, another guy from the Yacht Club, we're going to take the boat down to the Tortugas and go to Key West for a few days. This is in the middle of COVID. And, you know, do you want to come? We had a guy bail out and we have an opening. We thought of you, we'd like you to come with us. And I'm like, yeah, that, that sounds really good. Let me think about it, you know, and, and I'll call you back. And I came home, talked to, you know, my girlfriend and I said, you know, John just called, he's got this offer. We're going to do like a guy's trip. And she's like, what are you thinking about? She's like, go get out of here. You, you got to go do this. And I called him back. I'm like, I don't know what I was thinking. I'm, I'm in, let's go, let's do this. So we sailed the three of us from Tampa on, on his boat. It's a Tartan 4000, um, down to the dry Tortugas, spent a couple of days there at the fort, lots of stories, lots of anecdotes for another podcast, perhaps. Um, but it was gorgeous and and it's kind of like there's nothing there there's no facilities it's just you your boat your anchorage and fort jackson i believe it's fort jackson which is there you can tour that but there's really not much there there's there's not even a bathroom like they fly tourists in and out of key west there for the day and it is absolutely gorgeous it's the closest thing i've seen that's in the u.s that has the feel of being in the islands it's again very unspoiled and we're very fortunate to have it it's technically a national park um, and really, I think a bit overlooked by folks who, you know, some people have been and they rave about it, but a lot of people don't go for whatever reason. And, you know, if you're out here, even if you're in East coast, Florida, whatever, it's worth the trip. It's worth taking the time to go there. Neat. I love it. So this is great. So between say between racing, mm -hmm. between being part of a community where you have lots of friends with boats mm -hmm. and chartering, you're like a fantastic example of a avid active sailor that doesn't own a boat. It's Correct. fantastic. It can right? be done. It absolutely yeah. can be done. Yeah. I love it. And we've talked Let's... about, you know, we, we've talked Good. about buying a boat and we've looked at some boats, but you know, the thing is we're, we are very fortunate to be on the water a lot with people that, that we love dearly and the resources we think are better spent on charters and exploring, you know, places that we would never otherwise get to for our boat. Um, so that's kind like of Tahiti. right. It's a great that's example of that. Right. If you yeah. sunk a bunch of money and you were paying right a lot of fees all the time, right? You, that might not be in the budget, but exactly. Now it's in the you're never going to take your boat there. I mean, I mean, I guess you could, but I mean, you could, go, yeah, not while you're still working, and, right? You know, it we've had people that do that, but they can't hold down a job and do that at the same time. Exactly, you know? exactly. Even with the work from home revolution, like and yep. Starlink and all the things, like it's just not feasible. Um, yeah, and so that's that's worked out very very well for us. Love it. Let's go to the third topic um, and talk a little bit about brokers and kind of what our listeners might want to know about the buying and selling process from your perspective. Well, I mean, if if they bought and sold, then they're probably already familiar with it. Um, True. Maybe for know, first timers, right? Yeah. For, for first timers, um, 
it's like anything else, right? You have to find someone that you can trust. And the, the primary reason why I do this is it kind of goes back to what you said a second ago, somebody who doesn't have a boat, but likes being around boats, like being around the people on boats. Um, with the yacht brokerage thing, I spend a lot of time in marinas. I meet a lot of new people. Um, most of them wonderful people that I might not necessarily otherwise have met. Um, and it kind of scratches an itch for me in terms of teaching. Like I, I love to teach. I love to bring people into sailing and we get a lot of people that are new or they're stepping up from a dinghy and so they want a bigger boat or something that they can cruise on. And, um, you know, it's an opportunity for me to kind of teach them to kind of figure out where are they in their journey on sailing? What do they know? What do they not know? And work with them collaboratively to, to teach them. And what I would urge you to do is find, this sounds incredibly self-serving, but find a broker who has that approach. You know, there are a lot of brokers that are like used car salesmen, right? It's like, what, what can we do to get you in this boat today? Um, we don't do that. We try very hard to develop a relationship with people and find them the right boat. I mean, one of, one of the trite little things that I say is, you know, boats find their people and, and they do over time. And we have a number of boats in inventory at my brokerage and it may be the right boat for them. It may not. But if, I, if you can develop a relationship with your broker and get them to understand what it is that they're looking for, uh, a good broker has a lot to offer. I mean, we have access to the MLS and all this kind of stuff, but also um, knowledge of what's out there in the market, you know, what the pricing is, what's available. There's a seasonality element to it. You know, when people buy boats, when they leave Florida to go cruising in the Caribbean, when the boats come back. And then some people are done, they're done with sailing or they're done with that boat and want to upgrade. So we can kind of have a sense of what's coming onto the market. So um, if you can develop a sincere, authentic relationship with your broker, and if it's someone who's trustworthy, that's the way you want to go. You have to get, and, and not everyone clicks with everyone, of course, but find someone that you trust, find someone who understands what you're looking for and isn't just trying to close a deal. Because it's, it's if you find the wrong boat, you're going to be miserable. Like if you're, you're going to either overbuy or overpay or get something that's too much boat. If it's a couple that's new to sailing, they don't need a 45 foot monohull, you know, like get something 35 to 40 feet that works for you. Um, don't just pick the boat because it's shiny and new because it's there. There are boats that come out of charter that are great deals for some people. But if you have a couple that are sailing a boat and are going to sail a boat and cruise it, they don't need four staterooms and four heads, you know, get the owner. There'll be one that comes along with the owner configuration of one giant stateroom and then, you know, one or two guest staterooms, things like that, that, that they don't necessarily think about in terms of making the purchase decision. And a good reputable broker will, will guide you through that. But again, it's all about developing that relationship with that person. And what That's I found, I've been doing this for that long, but even, you know, with some of the few boats that I've sold, I, I get pictures from people that I've sold boats to, you know, they're rehabbing their boat. I get pictures of remember what the trampoline on the front of the catamaran looked like. We just replaced it. It looks like this and it's amazing. And you see what they're doing and you see, you know, the enjoyment that they're getting out of the boat. And in a way you're a part of that. And, you know, they have questions. Uh, we got to get this fixed. You know, who do you recommend? Well, we have a network of people that we trust that we can recommend who will do electrical systems, who will do fiberglass, who will do rigging, whatever. Uh, you know, and we continue that relationship and work with them. And we know that eventually that boat will come back to us and, you know, we'll list it again for the next person. And it kind of rolls over. Um, but it's, it's again, everything in sailing, I haven't really thought about it that much. Um, until now but everything in sailing really truly comes back to the relationships you know the, the boats are there but the boats are a platform for the relationships that you have um and i'm, I'm going to get really like melodramatic about it and it's not just the relationships with the other people it's the relationship that you yourself have with the sea and with testing boundaries and things like that like this race to mexico that we did i'm, I'm rambling way off topic but indulge me for a moment um we did a race to mexico it was it was 10 to 12 foot seas the whole way and it was about a four day race it took us to get there and it's one of those things where you know you you have your sh there were eight of us on the boat seven of us sorry and you have your shift where you're on and your shift where you're off but it's the kind of conditions where just being on the boat takes energy like even if you're not doing anything and you're trying to sleep there's so much movement and such an odd you know waveform it was kind of a, a an odd sea state it was a, a broad reach all the way down that even just sitting there, you're using muscles and using energy that you don't normally use. And it's exhausting. And, you know, by the time you get there, you really learn a lot about yourself and, and how you can handle things and what you're capable of handling. So, you know, when you're exhausted and wet and cold 
and you got to go up forward and do a sale change and it's just the last thing you want to do but you push yourself to do it and you come back and you go wow you know i'm i'm actually capable of doing a little bit more than i ever thought and you push those boundaries and you become very self-sufficient you learn about the boat you learn about the systems you learn about what's what and there really is it sounds silly to people who haven't been there there really is kind of a primal element to it of, of like being out at sea at night out of sight of land it's it's literally you and the stars and and the people that you're with and there's there's really nothing that compares to that quite the same way and and if you factor in the romance of the sea and all this kind of stuff it, it it's real it's a real thing you know and I'm, I'm a pretty cynical person you know me mike i mean I, I get pretty jaded by pretty much everything so for me to say that that's that's i think people will see that if they if they push themselves a little bit and, and, and push their boundaries and test themselves in their boats absolutely but i really love how you you put that chris and it is so it's you know at the center of it it's you and the and the and the ocean or you in the water and and the boat is part of that and the people that you meet um and then the people that you race against and it becomes kind of the social community and even mm -hmm. inserting the broker in there right that you can just do the brokers a one-off thing or the brokers part of your network you know and it's a exactly. uh, i've had exactly. the same experience in buying a house right like we had one exactly. realtor that we really trust so we did a couple of transactions with her and again this idea of helping and supporting and sharing and um instead of an adversarial relationship like a lot of times that it has been um right. it, it, you know it, that that one was a winner right and maybe other people it, she wouldn't connect have connected with but for us it, it kind of worked and it's right. that kind of matching and and talking with yeah. people and listening and, and seeing it's not transactional it's, not it's a relationship and it's, yep. it's you know let's let's make this fun and again it's boating right it's it's supposed to be fun it's supposed to be you know something that you enjoy doing and that you enjoy learning about and and as a broker you get to be a part of that and, and it's it's exciting it's a lot of fun it's challenging too and and you know like some people you meet other brokers or or various people that you know are maybe less trustworthy it's it's unfortunate and you get a little jaded by that but yeah the, the biggest advice i would offer to people is is shop brokers until you find somebody you like and stick with them you know like they'll they'll, they'll do right by you if you find the right person and um you know, and, and again, speaking of East Coast, you know, if anybody's looking for folks, they can reach out to me. I mean, we can put my contact information in the show notes, what have you. Um, I also have a YouTube channel that I'm starting up. A little plug, sorry. Um, but I'm happy to, to make recommendations. Encouraged. Like there are, you know, I have a growing network of brokers up and down the East Coast of Florida. I've got a couple of guys in California that I know too that I would recommend. And, and they may not be the right person for that particular client but they will connect them with someone who is these are you know reputable people who have been doing it for a long time and they base it on doing it the right way and developing those relationships and again that's that's where the fun is i mean you you can make a substantial amount of money in brokerage but really the enjoyment comes more from seeing people find the right boats and then sailing with them you know you have to spend a lot of time sailing with clients you know teaching them the boat a little bit and finding I have a number of captains that I work with that both teach and will do deliveries and things like that. And it's, it's this wonderful little community of people that are helping each other. And it's, it's really about that at the end of the day. Neat. I love it, Chris, this was great. So we've got, you know, the three different perspectives, kind of the, the idea of racing as a way to get into the boating community and, 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 and find people and find your place. Um, the chartering is a way to expand your reach and to do things uh, that maybe you wouldn't do just in your local kind of neighborhood and then this third piece is the broker and uh it all kind of was wrapped into nicely your psychological you know being a psychologist your psychological view on this i think was fantastic um well, thank you. for the last question i have for you is is sure. one one we always ask which is um is there anything that i should have asked you and didn't ah that's a really good question um no, I think you covered it pretty well i mean there's there are always more anecdotes and more stories but I think the way you buttoned it up just now, uh, you know, wraps it up nicely in a way that that we have like a nice little kind of coherent package for 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 this particular podcast. Um, you know, if there's interest, uh, I'm happy to do a deeper dive into any of the three areas if 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 we'd like to do that. Um, but as far as anything else, I, well, I will say this: what one thing that you didn't really ask the question, but I'll put it out there because maybe it's helpful is. Um, if you're going to go charter if you're going to you know take that step patience like things in the islands happen on island time and there are a lot of very successful people in the yachting world you know everybody loves the word yachting 
um, you know, who expect things to happen when they want them done. And in the US, things operate on a very different time schedule and a different time scale than they do in the islands. So, you know, bring some patience as you make that transition coming from the US, say flying into Puerto Rico, and then like a little puddle jumper flight into Tortola, uh, you will see a dramatic shift in the speed with which things happen and the urgency. And that's okay. Everybody expects that, everybody knows that, but if you haven't done it before, it, it takes a little time to make that adjustment. Um, Inter, and, you know, intercultural competence. Yeah. Intercultural competence is something that I teach, and that might be an interesting episode, is kind of give some basics, um, not only orientation to time, as you said, but high context versus low context, so how you build these relationships is very Absolutely. different, how people are evaluated, how you give feedback to people, all these things can vary greatly just a few hundred kilometers from, or a few hundred miles from, you know, from where you're sitting right now in Tampa, you can be uh, in, in a radically different culture. So it's, I think 100%. that's really neat. Maybe that's a, that's a good episode for another time is kind of some basics of intercultural competence, um, yeah. especially in the Caribbean and um, areas that are people on the East coast might be sailing to. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And it's part of the prep. And again, you know, talk to as many people as you can. And, you know, for, for those of your listeners who are, are new or maybe a little, you know, tentative about it, find a local yacht club or sailing center and, and go volunteer to race. Um, not every boat will welcome everyone. You know, we're all human beings. And then you have, you know, the resident badass hardcore racers that are like, you know, we have our crew and we're not going to take the new people out. You know, that's fine stay away from those people. There are 10 other boats that are welcoming, that want to teach you how to sail. They want to meet new people. They want to introduce people to the sport. You know, a big part of it is watching people's eyes light up when the sails are up and the engine turns off and the boat heels over and they're like, I've never done anything like this before. And, you know, those of us who love to sail, we love to share that moment. It's, it's nice. We get people like that every Thursday. We have people that are new and watching their, their reaction to, I had no idea this was available to me in my backyard. And, and here it is, and they learn to avail themselves of it. And and trust me, the people that you meet, they want to share this with you. So you're welcome. I love it. Yeah. Chris, on that note, let's wrap it up. So Chris Kapisiak, uh, how can I describe you? Um, sailor, <laughs> psychologist, and broker, right? Thanks for joining us on the podcast. You've been a great guest. Thanks for having me, Mike. I really enjoyed it. Okay, shoes on the other foot, Bela. What did you think? Uh, well, Mike, I thought it was, first of all, good interview. Uh, I think uh, we can uh, we can get you to do more interviews. That would be great. Uh, yeah, when I retire, like you, pal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, retirement. I highly recommend it. So I thought Chris was a great guest, right? He's clearly an enthusiastic sailor and all around good person. Uh, it was his energy level was just uh, remarkable. <clears throat> and you know, again, we hear about this evening racing. It's been something we've heard other people mention that that's a way that they got into it so at most places most bodies of water that have sailboats there's probably some evening of the week where some of those boats are out there sailing and racing each other whether it be around a buoy or around an island or something and that's a great way to get into sailing um there, there'll definitely be at least one boat at that marina where they originate from that's looking for someone that's looking for help because either one of their normal crew people didn't show up or they just need need another body on the boat. And that's a great way to get into sailing, as, as you guys discussed. Um, and, you know, you can learn about sailing, and it's also a great kind of social activity that you can draw on and get to, the, to know, know people. Uh, you clearly will uh, learn about teamwork because if you're racing and, and sailing a boat requires different individuals doing different things. And, uh, you know, I think, I think you'll, you'll also learn about leadership styles, <laughs> the, the amount of yelling that takes place or doesn't take place. Uh, and in a sailboat race, you'd say, I mean, what can be excited? What can be, you know, exciting about it or, or what's, what's time critical. You're only going four or five miles an hour. Well, boats all tend to converge around the buoy that everyone's turning around. And when there's a start, the starting sequence for a sailboat race, race is sort of interesting. And maybe we can get someone on there that's more of a racer than I am that can sort of talk about that. But all the boats want to be in the same place at the same time for the start fundamentally. And there's a lot of rules of the road that who has the right of way over somebody else. So there's, 
there's an amazing amount of sort of uh, tension, anxiety, excitement, whatever you want to call it, that can happen at four and a half miles an hour. It, it really is remarkable. Um, it's also something that all ages can participate in. Um, and uh, it's it's sort of, you know, pretty, pretty cool from that. Um, what were some of the, your thoughts on the whole thing, Mike? Well, Bela, I thought it was super interesting that sailing is such a rich part of Chris's life. It's a huge part of his social life. It's part of how he defines himself. We didn't get into it, but it's a huge part of his partnership with uh, his, his girlfriend that he lives with um, for a long time. Um, and he doesn't own a boat, right? Um, <laughs> and I hadn't really thought about this. This wasn't something that was kind of in my face. And really, that you don't even need to own a boat to be an active sailor. Now you have to live in the right place and you know, there's other things, but this lifestyle that Chris has built without a boat um, is, is really pretty cool. So I guess my question back to you is, is this approach typical among the people you know? And is it really possible to be an active and passionate sailor without being a boat owner? So I think some people will tell you it's the wisest way to be a sailor. Because <laughs> uh, Boat ownership has has a lot of uh, sort of challenges with it, sucks up a lot of your time, uh, and it can be expensive. So uh, I think it is a reasonable model uh, to, to sort of partake in. So for many, many years, we owned a small boat on a lake, and we sailed that, and it was pretty easy to take care of, blah, blah, blah. And our bigger boat experience was all sort of chartering it. It was on other people's boats. We'd go rent a boat for a week. Uh, and we'd, we'd enjoy that and, and, and had a great time. So chartering is certainly one great way of doing that. Um, the other great way of, of sort of doing that is we've already talked about it, sort of racing, right? Racing in other people's boats. And you know what, then you'll, again, this whole racing thing and, you know, hanging around the, the marina on Wednesday or Thursday night, whatever night they, they do their racing, not only are you going to get engaged with that community, but you will meet other people who maybe are not so much into racing and are, in, are into cruising. And they, and maybe their spouse doesn't want to come on every trip. And, you know, I've talked about having uh, friends of mine come along with me on various different trips that I've done. Uh, so that's also a great way uh, to sort of uh, go sailing on other people's boats and be able to experience all of this stuff. Um, so I, I think that's kind of neat. I think the other interesting thing was Chris talked about chartering down like in a BVI, which is like one of the big industries down in the British Virgin Islands. Uh, it's a big mecca for chartering. Uh, the Greek islands have now sort of blossomed into a really big chartering destination. But he also talked about chartering in sort of more remote places. And so the balance here is uh, sort of infrastructure and support. You can go down to the BVI and you can go with a big charter company down there and they will provision the boat for you. And what do I mean by provision? You tell them what kind of food you want. The refrigerator will be stocked full of, they'll take care of everything. <laughs> Basically, you just have to show up. And, and that's one of the great things about the places that are sort of these chartering meccas is they have that sort of infrastructure. They have that breadth and depth of service uh, that that you can take advantage of if you want. You can go to more remote places like Chris talked about where they don't have all of that stuff and you're sort of more on your own. So here again, you can have the sort of type of adventure that you want. Uh, there's a wide range here, which I think is, is, is really, really kind of cool. Um, so that was some of my thoughts on, on, on that part. Uh, you know, of not having to own a boat. You can charter, you can get on friends' boats, uh, you can do this weeknight racing thing. Uh, those things are really good. You have any additional thoughts, Mike? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think it, it's kind of interesting to me that he's built his social life about around this, and then now he's kind of started on the business side with being a broker. And I mean, that's a relatively new part of this, but he's gained so much of expertise, I think, and understanding boats, even though he doesn't own one himself, right? But I think he had one in the past. Um, and his network, right? That's kind of a cool way to do it. If you can make some money in your in your 
it's something that you love and you know a lot about why not um and he's using i think some of his you know psychologists make really good salespeople a lot of times because they understand how people think and make decisions and their biases so i think that really goes goes kind of together and i think at the end of the day and maybe we can talk about bringing chris back this idea i mentioned it in the interview part this idea of how psychology and sailing intertwine is fascinating and he raised a few interesting questions that might be really interesting to kind of pursue you know and you mentioned it too kind of this idea of uh, teamwork and leadership and things like this um so i think there's lots of ways that psychologically nourish people who are sailors and with some of these outcomes that we've talked about where yeah people get along you know regardless of uh, not always, but mostly regardless of their political persuasions or their beliefs, that it's this community. And maybe we can unpack a little bit of this um, because at the end of the day, if you talk to sociologists or anthropologists, these communities have ties that run deeper than merely the exchange of goods and services, right? That there's something deeper there that connects people. And this might be an interesting follow-up conversation. Might be, you know, I don't know, maybe the listeners won't be interested in it, but we can talk about whether we want to go down that road or not. But I thought there was this neat undercurrent of what Chris was talking about with the psychology background to do that. But anyways, great conversation. I learned a lot about Chris and a slightly different approach to sailing that I really hadn't thought about based on all of our guests, right? For, you know, all these episodes that we've done over a hundred, right? It's always people who pretty much own a boat with a couple exceptions, right? So um, Chris's contact info is in the show notes if you want to get in touch with them on the brokerage side or if you have any questions on what's going on down there in the Tampa area, um, I'm sure he would be willing to, um, to have a conversation with you. And most importantly, listeners, thanks for joining us for another episode and maybe putting up with my slightly subpar interview skills compared to Bela because it's a little rusty. Um, but I hope you, th you found the conversation interesting and thought provoking uh, nonetheless. And if you have questions about what we've discussed, please always feel free to get in touch with us. I think, you know, our email is sailing the East. That's all one word at gmail.com. Hey, and if you enjoyed the podcast, uh, tell your friends about it. Uh, we'd love to get some more listeners. Um, and if you know someone that would be a good guest for the show, uh, let us know. Uh, we'd love to have them uh, in one of these episodes. So signing off until next time from chilly and cold upstate New York. See you all soon. Thanks, Bela. And from over here in Münster, Germany, auf Wiedersehen.